and the transcripts. All righty. All right, I uh, just want to say thank you um, to everyone for being here this afternoon. Um, have a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. We are recording this session. Um, it will be sent out to uh, registrants, you know, after the um, conference is over, you'll get an email with the recordings. It is also being captioned. If you would like to turn off the closed caption, you can do that by clicking the arrow next to live transcript and selecting hide subtitle. Uh, because this session is being recorded, that does include chat. So even private chats will be part of the transcript of the session. So please be aware of that. If you have any questions, you can feel free to put those in the chat. Vivi and I will both uh, be monitoring that um, to help Alan as he's leading his presentation. Um, and also want to let you know, um, this is our last session for the day. Um, you, if you were one of the winners for one of the drawings that we've had as part of this conference, you will be notified by email if you win. We do appreciate you joining us today. Um, we will not come back um, for a closing session. So when we finish today, we are finished. And now I'm going to turn it over to Alan Unsworth and he is going to share with us on building electronic collections to meet patron needs. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. My name is Alan Unsworth. I'm the Director of Academic Support and Research at Surrey Community College. Uh, so today I really wanted to talk about uh, why I'm starting to feel like it's critical for academic libraries specifically to begin prioritizing electronic acquisition over print acquisition. Uh, with our obvious current state, um, our current climate, I think that the balance is shifted currently, but also permanently towards electronic. Um, now I'm not saying fully electronic, I'm just saying uh, I'm gonna argue today that the priority needs to be going forward, thinking about intentional um, electronic book, ebook uh, acquisition and other uh, e-format uh, materials. Uh, so I'm gonna discuss uh, some of the latest trends, the projections on this topic uh, then talk about some of the models of purchasing electronic materials. Um, there's, they do differ, and a lot of people like myself, when I researched this, wasn't so sure. I kind of had a vague idea about what they were, but we'll talk about the different models of acquiring uh, electronic uh, books, videos. I'm also going to discuss some of the practical ways that we can think about expanding digital collections outside of NC Live, uh, which we have a lot of offerings, luckily, in this state through NC Live. Uh, so, obviously, the elephant in the room is the pandemic. Uh, pandemics obviously overturn societies in lots of different ways uh, through the education system, which impacts a lot of us, uh, healthcare systems, uh, socioeconomics we've seen happen, obviously, economics, race relations, uh, and just everyday sort of family life gets upended. Uh, and a report that was issued just a few weeks ago. Uh, it asked 915 researchers and like, subject experts uh, like what they felt life would be like in 2025. Uh, so this is a projection report. Uh, and there's a lot in this report. It's like 200 pages long. But when it's looked at from a library perspective, there, there are certainly a lot of things that we can leverage in that report uh, and to continue to expand on our importance in society. It's not definitely not all doom and gloom, for sure. But the broad and nearly universal conclusion of the report is that people's relationship with technology is just going to continue to deepen as larger segments of the population come to rely even more on digital connections for everything from school, healthcare, work, uh, business, social interactions. Um, so a number of the respondents sort of hinted at this, this word or mentioned this word, the tele-everything world is what we're entering. Uh, where there's just a broad adoption of electronic processes. Uh, so we've obviously all seen teleworking, uh, uh, increase in telemedicine, e-commerce, uh, virtual education. Uh, in 2025, it's projected there will be more people working from home, more virtual and social uh, entertainment interactions, fewer visits into the public than has been the case in previous years. So there's also a consensus from this Pew report that humans yearning for convenience and safety will fuel an even higher reliance on digital tools. 
So we may have gotten a taste of sort of what may be to come, maybe not the full experience, but we've gotten a little bit of that. The pandemic seems to maybe have rearranged incentives, so consumers will be more willing to seek out smart systems, resources, gadgets, and apps. Okay, so topics of discussion today. So I've already sort of mentioned and hinted at this. It's a kind of an urgent time when we sort of need to start thinking about uh, transitioning. Uh, I also want to talk about um, transitioning, obviously, uh, libraries from these repositories of physical materials into sort of full service online success hubs. Uh, we we're already moving in that direction. The pandemic has accelerated that change. Uh, and we've already seen, obviously, an increased use and reliance on digital collections and more interest in self-service and online programming. Uh, unlike some of the services on our college campuses, libraries were pretty well positioned to make the transition to online learning. Roughly seven out of 10 librarians have agreed that pre-pandemic digital presence that they had was good enough that substantial changes were not needed uh, to survive the frantic transition into uh, wholesale remote learning. Uh, so to be clear, in the community college system, our membership at NC Live is what saved us, the majority of us. Uh, and those resources were why we were able to handle the transition, not so much our intentional ebook acquisition. It was our membership in a large cooperative. Uh, so we've been able to take on that uh, wholesale change to remote learning because of that core base of online articles, ebooks, videos that we have through NC Live. So while your library may already be doing this, the vast majority of libraries are not purchasing individual electronic titles with consistency or with any intent. And uh, that was certainly not a priority in our book collection here at my college. Uh, and to be honest, because of the NC Live collection, we felt like we were pretty well covered with a lot of the basics for academics, for the academic um, programs we offer. Uh, so we could focus a lot of our spending. We felt we were at liberty to sp spend on the print collection. Okay, so I do want to talk a little bit about uh, ebook and audiobook trends as well. Then we'll get to vendor statistics. Then we'll talk about the pros and cons, the challenges, opportunities. Uh, and then, I'll, as I promised, I'll talk about the acquisition models, the different ways that you can acquire electronic materials, and then um, maybe some possible uh, solutions, both short and, and long term, uh, to meet needs now and also to look into, into the future. So I wanted to start today talking about some of the trends. Uh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> Hopefully I won't overwhelm you. Uh, 2020 was the first year that average academic library ebook spending overtook print. But even before COVID, ebook spending was on the uptick in academic libraries. So we were already trending this way. And I'm not going to argue in this presentation, as you might have got the suggestion, I'm trying to say print is dead. I definitely don't think it is. I think our students will come back to the library. And it's just simply that a model of collection development, uh, it was working and it probably will not work uh, the same way going forward. Uh, so I'm pretty confident that, you know, print materials are good. Uh, we can continue to buy them. It's just more of the shift in the way of thinking. And over 80% of library directors that were surveyed see their physical locations and collections as essential still. So very few people are saying that we can just do away with these print collections. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, and the, those same directors, that same percentage roughly, say that the time is now to invest much more in digital services and resources for the long term. So uh, this, the problem with this is that uh, when we advance this notion, we start to talk about, uh, or people will start to think about reductions in the physical space of the library. So this really can't come at the expense of a reduction to library space, because even as our institutions uh, as a whole shift towards the digital, so many students that we see are struggling to access technology, struggling with finding proper study quiet spaces, struggling to find community and a sense of belonging uh, at, their, at their college or institution. So it'd be a huge mistake to like reduce the physical library space. 
So I think there's sort of a, a, a middle point I'm trying to find here uh, that's not going to be too extreme. The main point here is we need to find new ways of spending limited money we have to provide the most items as we can in the most accessible formats to serve the most students. And I think most of us kind of get that. Uh, so while right now ebooks comprise about one third of academics, uh, academic libraries monograph collections, by 2025, library directors are anticipating spending uh, twice as much on ebooks as they will on physical books. So we're talking about for four or five years, they'll be uh, anticipating that library directors will spend twice as much on ebooks as on physical books. Uh, so last year, over 105 libraries in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia loaned out over 1 million ebooks. Uh, that is a very staggering number compared to everything prior to that. Uh, those same 105 libraries saw a staggering 30% growth compared to 2019. Several of them more than doubled online checkouts. On the publishing side of things, the industry had sales go through the roof last year. When the US slammed shut in March, People panicked and thought the book sales were going to completely drop off, and they did very sharply, but it did not last. By June, demand was back up, uh, and even though most of the, the sales went to big box stores and Amazon, even small bookstores uh, in general had good years. Uh, the print sales went up by 8%, and obviously the ebook side went up even more than that. We're talking about twice as much, 17 or 16%. And e-audio, despite e-audio being a heavy relier on commuting, people commuting for the demand, despite commuting uh, just being you know, killed off basically, e-audio was still up 17%. E-audio is, is one area that is really rising in popularity that we need to really take a close look at uh, because there's great demand there that we're, we're definitely seeing uh, anecdotally yeah, on my side of things in the community college system. Okay. Um, Front list titles uh, have been sold the most. So things like other uh, popular titles, right? So things that are offered in Hoopla or Overdrive uh, digital, digitally, uh, those have sold the most. Uh, young adult eBooks have been up more than 20%. Uh, interestingly, the nonfiction, uh, because of quarantine, I think, home and garden arts and crafts titles are way up. Uh, so it's interesting what went up and what went down, but uh, young adult and home and garden, kind of home home uh, uh, arts and crafts books went up and textbooks dipped sharply. That was the one area that really got cut off, uh, probably because of the shift towards remote learning. Uh, but we can trick ourselves and say it's because of OER, but I, I think it's more towards uh, the demand for textbooks as withdrawals increased and people kind of uh, abandoned uh, their classroom or didn't see the need for the textbook as much uh, being at home. And according to a recent report from the new publishing standard, projection is very strong that publishers are basically at this point forward going to be taking a hard look at why they have not pushed ebooks forward harder for much of the last decade when they already had the technology. So while this pandemic is not like an extinction event for print, the expectation is that whenever we return to that more normal life, digital books are just going to play a much larger role in the lives of consumers and in our lives, lives of librarians and publishers. And the publishers will be pushing ebooks, which will impact us in, in that way. Uh, the report from uh, the new publishing standard states emphatically global publishing will never return to the pre pandemic status. Like we, it's, it's over. We're always going to be skewed more heavily towards the electronic now that we've got people using the electronic. Okay, so, so a couple more trends here. Um, before 2017, ebooks were still pretty uh, niche and like checking out ebooks in the library was really difficult. It's still kind of hard, but in the, <laughs> like the earlier days, it was super difficult. I made a lib guide one time that just like laid out tabs of how to access ebooks from different vendors. And it was like bullet point after bullet point on each tab and uh, very, very quirky <laughs> and uh, very tedious to do this. Uh, and in part because of that, uh, I think they didn't catch on with people and very few people associated the library with eBooks and eAudio. Uh, they didn't know that we offered it. No. Even Overdrive, which is now much more popular than it was. Back then it was, it was slow and clunky. 
uh, they had about 200 million checkouts in 2016. And by 2020, they checked out uh, 400 and th over 430 million checkouts last year. So they more than doubled their checkouts. Uh, and that's because Overdrive developed a Libby, the Libby app, which is very similar to the Hoopla, which is a competitor. And there's a couple of other ones that are have developed very Amazon-like uh, apps that libraries are using. Uh, I have some data on Libby, uh, so I'm talking about that one specifically. Uh, Libby app downloads increased more than three times their usual amount beginning in late March of last year. And ebook growth has just continued to come on. New users continue to grow. Uh, last year, they increased more than 50% over 2019. And uh, just in March and June, between March and June of last year, more than 300,000 Overdrive accounts were created. So Overdrive seeing a huge increase. I'm sure Hoopla is the same. It, you know, Swank probably, some of the other uh, e-format e vendors, I'm sure, are seeing this huge increases as well. This is a large surge in usage. And the technology in library databases is improving, so the ease of access is becoming less of an issue. So people are starting to say, hey, this isn't so bad. People, oh, you have a library. That was, that was a good experience coming back. Um, so most libraries sort of uh, agree. 74% uh, of libraries are reporting they'll be purchasing more eBooks in the future because of the growing popularity. So we're definitely seeing the fact that people are going to be using ebooks much more uh, in the future. And in libraries, they become much more popular as well. Okay, so give me one second here. So I just want to show a couple slides about my God. So the first one is from, sorry, from EBSCO. And so I asked a bunch of different vendors to give me statistics that they had, and most of them obliged nicely. So you can see EBSCO had some pretty dramatic shifts. Uh, you'll notice the ebook stats uh, on all these slides I'm getting ready to show you, ebook stats are going up. You'll just see a sharper trend in 2020. That's really kind of the, a, the surge that you might expect to see. Um, but we're kind of drawn ourselves into the point of no return probably. Um, okay, so here's the EBSCO, dramatic shift upwards, obviously. And just so you know, let's show some other ones too. So here's ProQuest. This is just North Carolina eBooks. And this is showing you all the years between 2016. And you'll see pretty steady increase and then kind of blowing it away in 2020. Uh, the trends are interesting when it goes up and down. Obviously, you might think it's with the academic calendar. Here's just US views alone. So this is all electronic things. This is ProQuest electronic stuff. And then I have a world one too, which is looks almost exactly like the US one. So you see, this is not just in the US. This is this is a trend that's everywhere. And notice just the widening gap there. And here's just where my own community, the North Carolina Community College, I pulled stats from NC Live. And this shows just the huge increase. NC Live, I've seen their stats from previous years, and it's always a steady little growth. But for my community, it was just an explosion last year. So maybe I'm seeing things through uh, my own you know, perspective of this is a really dire situation because everyone's jumping on uh, to the online bandwagon, but we're really seeing it in my, in my area especially. So you may be seeing that in your community too, but I wanted to show you sort of some of the larger, some of the larger trends Okay, across the country and world. All right, so some of the challenges, of course, first thing is our attachment to print. Uh, librarians are attached, we attached our lives to print for purchasing and processing, housing, weeding, and enjoying them ourselves. So it's difficult to face the shifting balance to eBooks when it's easier and more comfortable to remain sticking with what has always been our mainstay. So again, not saying it's going away completely, uh, but many of us are not doing intentional ebook purchasing. Many patrons are attached to print as well. It's not just us. We know that. And they want us to have their favorite authors and titles in print. And we know from studies and surveys that students do prefer and do a better job with deep reading when they have print. So electronic articles are very popular with students, as we know, because 
of this very thing. He doesn't require as much in-depth reading. They can do a browse job and still pull out some content, get some quotes. Uh, so most articles are easier to read. They can do that on electronic uh, a format or an electronic electronic format. Reading online was made for this for this browsing sort of uh, research. Whereas we know that print, a challenge is going to be making sure we're still buying things that people need when they want to do the in depth research. But we know that we cannot afford to purchase in every format. So we'll talk more about this in a second. But we know again. Some of our patrons want to read in print. We understand that. We feel a lot of compassion. We feel a lot of empathy for that. Uh, and as I stated previously, um, this is changing for the better, but we're still trying to gain that awareness in the public so they associate libraries with ebooks. So, one challenge is this attachment that society has to us as this warehouse of print books. So, we need to continue to make it aware to our patrons that we are in the business of ebooks in the business of video, of online videos. Uh, we have, we need to use a variety of marketing techniques to do this. So direct marketing in print, social media, websites, uh, friendly radio stations, wherever we can, in our library catalogs, uh, our search engines, if you have a discovery service, you know, put up a promo in there. We need to make it very clear to people that we have eBooks and we will buy eBooks for you for what you want to read. Uh, and of course, as I said, the, the, the cost and budget concerns is, is a huge because, you know, as we know, budgets are remaining flat in general or decreasing. Uh, there are some exceptions, but in general, most librarians believe that their budget will either decrease or remain flat uh, going forward. So there's not a lot of optimism. This is generally true. There's not a lot of positive feeling about budgets going forward. So we know that we have limited budgets and we know that we can't buy Every, every book we want in every format. And since ebooks tend to cost more than print books, it's a challenge to think about trying to provide everything needed with the limited money that we have. Because ebooks on average cost about eight, or sorry, about $19 more per book. Uh, and multi user access is often far more expensive. However, this doesn't take into account a couple of things. And that the first is you cannot offer multi-use access in the first place with a single print copy. And number two, this type of thinking isn't taking into account all of the hidden costs associated with print books. Things from shipping costs to the handling by your non-library facility staff to the processing of the materials in your library, all the materials that are needed to do that processing, the staff time, the shelving of the books, the physical storing of the books, all of these little hidden costs sort of add up too, and it's hard to sort of see some of those costs. Uh, and we're so used to dealing and handling those costs. Um, it also can be kind of a useful exercise to think through some of the reasons for the cost increase on the publisher's uh, side. So from their perspective, and believe me, I know many of the opposite reasons or some of the, uh, some of the uh, objections to these points. Uh, why it doesn't make sense for electronic to necessarily cost more than print. Uh, but again, for the sake of objectivity, let's do a little exercise here. So to a publisher, ebooks present a greater threat to retail sales than print books, because unlike print, library patrons can check out, download, and read ebooks on their smartphones from anywhere. Whereas th there are so many barriers to checking out the physical book from the library. Right, there's, you have to get in the car, you have to drive to the library, you have to find the book on the shelf or ask for it if it's not available. You know, there's all these different things that come up. Transportation, uh, the due date, having to remember to bring the things back. I mean, there's just so many different barriers to getting the book in your hand. Um, so there's nearly no barriers to checking out, reading and returning an ebook from a technologically advanced library vendor. So this ease of access is a direct concern for publishers, since unrestricted library lending could lead to lost sales. Whereas, like, um, you also would see unreasonable uh, compensation for authors and artists as well, which is another concern. If the publisher's not getting their money, the author's not going to get the money. And they're going to have less incentive to write the books. So 
new technology is coming out and it's making it easier for libraries to deliver ebooks and streaming videos and other electronic things uh, with little to no barriers. It's awesome for us, but it's bad for the publishers because people simply won't buy their materials if we make it this easy. <laughs> it's really uh, sort of a weird position to be in. Um, I do think with most, most academic library vendors, the threat is really overblown because they're so bad at providing that seamless uh, platform framework for getting the ebook that uh, it simply isn't that much ease of access, but they're getting better and better. And some uh, of the uh, vendors, especially those who are providing popular content are doing a really good job of providing a seamless experience. And if you use Libby or you use Hoopla, you know that it's a one button, it's an, it's an Amazon-like experience. And that's a huge threat to the publisher's bottom line. It really is. Uh, so that's one reason why they jack the price up because they want to make sure they get their money up front since they're not going to be getting, you're not going to be selling as many print copies. Um, so I think it's just important to kind of understand some of, some of those issues from a publisher's perspective. Uh, and we should be informed about sort of those feelings uh, and not simply think of them as, as the bad guy because um, we all love authors and artists. And so we want to support them in order for them to be supported. We need the publishers to be understood and, you know, they need to get their money somehow. Not that I agree with the pricing, but um, we should be educated. Also, there's legal and copyright issues. Um, this is a really complex subject and it's very much related to the cost issue as well. Uh, these issues are a serious challenge for libraries and publishers. Uh, obviously, the legal framework for lending physical books is different than that for ebooks. So, while the library may generally lend a physical copy in any manner it chooses, under current law, a library can only lend an ebook in the manner that's approved by the copyright holder, which is usually the publisher. The publisher can limit the length of time during which the library may lend the book. Uh, the number of checkouts or both. And these limitations can restrict the library's ability to meet patron demand. Then from the publisher's viewpoint, there's also the risk of piracy. Uh, publishers are greatly concerned about this and they go to great lengths to prevent piracy. And honestly, I know that almost anything that you want is out there and available on a sketchy website, but the piracy risk is one that publishers use to justify the increased costs. Uh, so the publishers ebooks at risk because it's just easier to, to control piracy and market with a physical book. Uh, the ebook allows uh, for piracy at a higher higher rate. But on the other hand, the nature of ebook technology prevents the development of this secondary used book market. So there's also sort of a counter to that. Uh, so the last thing I was going to mention was I already hinted at this was the platform. Uh, so many platforms are, are terrible, but a lot of publishers think it's just far too easy for people to get their hands on ebooks. Uh, so they want to make the process, so they, they would like the process to be as difficult as, uh, as possible, honestly. Um, and there aren't that many one click solutions like an Amazon sort of experience, although they are increasing. Um, a more general problem with the platforms and challenge for us is that. We have so many different platforms that vary in appearance and layout and functionality. Uh, lack of standardization it has made patrons and librarians uh, unwilling or reluctant to use ebooks or for on our end to acquire them. Uh, it just looks bad, right? It's not a good experience. You don't want to promote that because it's a terrible experience for everybody. Uh, the quirkiness of the various platforms, it makes us worry that there's you know, some dissonance for the user and that patrons may not return to use ebooks after having a bad experience with one of the platforms. Uh, there are some studies that show that, that our patrons actually don't care as much as we think about uh, platforms, but it certainly bothers me um, aesthetically and also just in my mind, thinking about my own experience, how I would feel. Um, and again, some ebook vendors do a much better job uh, with their with their platforms, but the majority of college uh, materials are coming from ProQuest or EBSCO, and we all know that you know getting content from books in those databases is not really the easiest thing if you're trying to download to a device and have it house it on your own device. 
Uh, so platform variations are, are real problems for libraries with user uh, support and instruction. As I mentioned, I made this libguide with all these different vendors and how to download books. Uh, so it's really com complicated. You have to have instruction manuals on how to get materials out of these databases. So you have to maintain those sort of guides too and continue to train yourself and you know when they change the platform a little bit. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is the opportunities. So existing collections, we, as I mentioned before, we are already able to provide a great amount of materials through NC Live. We are already able to offer um, a lot of resources in an accessible way. We've slowly begun preparing for this moment since 1998 when NCLI was formed. The state has constantly been adding materials to its own collections through subscriptions, but also through permanent purchasing. NC Live has purchased uh, ebooks through EBSCOhost, uh, perpetual access uh, for a long time, and they continue to invest money in those. Uh, ebooks uh, whenever they have extra money. So we have a great base of materials through NC Live, and we have also done a good job on our own of buying databases and understanding the needs of our, um, of, of our populations. So we buy our own databases outside of NC Live. Uh, one other opportunity right now is that although we're sort of maybe coming out of some of the worst of the pandemic, it is still a time to experiment um, where you can sort of take risks. Maybe, you know, this summer, if you, you know, have some money or you, the budget year starts, maybe you could take some risk without having to, to worry so much about the consequences. Um, folks are generally forgiving as everyone is sort of new to this experience and risk taking is becoming the new norm and failure in general is being seen as more acceptable because no one's faced this situation before. So it's the best time if there was gonna be one, I think to experiment and try new things. Um, if the prototype of some new initiative doesn't work, ju you know, just move on to the next one and just say, oh, you know, I didn't, you know, that one didn't work. Yeah, what did I know? It was, you know, pandemic. So uh, it's a good excuse to try new things, I think. Uh, so libraries shouldn't miss the opportunity to take those expect to make those uh, take those chances and also to sort of reevaluate as I said earlier the physical repository so we're always going to have the repository of books but it's important that we take the opportunity now to start or start to really pound into people's brains that we are so far beyond that we have been for a long time and it's always been frustrating to me and to a lot of others that we have shifted to electronic access for a long time, but we need to make it known that this is our priority. It's on scholarly communication as well. We are campus communities. We are spaces for learning, for thinking, for communicating. Uh, the sort of the time is, is now to start thinking beyond the library as this physical repository and toward the concept of a library as an incubator and think tank for learning and, re uh, and research. Uh, this is also a great time to promote library staff that can design. So it, libraries that had instructional designers on staff or people with those skills were the best able libraries to handle the shift because they just had stuff built, uh, ready to go, or they were able to make tutorials, bam, right off the bat, you know, one and a half minute little quick tutorials, shoot those out. Um, so this is a great time to advocate, to add people with great technology skills to your staff. Um, and also, obviously, the big one, 94% of librarians see the number one thing with the opportunities is obviously electronic materials provide anytime, anywhere access, which we know students need. More and more, we are seeing students working crazy hours, coming to school, doing their homework at crazy hours, wanting, uh, wanting to meet with their faculty, wanting to meet with uh, staff at random hours. This is becoming sort of the new norm. So because of this, we need to be able to provide eBooks because of the library can always be open, um, most of our libraries at least. So the eBook makes sure the student can always get their hands on the content, regardless of when they're doing the work, the sort of uh, nine to five, you know, 
timeline is just so far off base for so many of us. University and, and especially community colleges is just not even close to being a, a real model of service anymore. Okay, so now I really wanna to talk to you about some of the methods of acquisition, because this was very confusing to me when I was trying to dig into this. How would I go about purchasing electronic books in a smart way? I've always heard horror stories about um, overspending or there's just too much out there. It's too overwhelming. Um, how can we afford to begin purchasing eBooks that are so much more expensive than print. Uh, so according to ProQuest, they did a recent survey and uh, more than 70% of libraries were using multiple models here. So sort of the, the framework to think about is this pyramid maybe using a little bit of each one of these or experimenting with different ones. So the bottom layer here is our most essential and that's our the sub, the subscription. So that bottom layer is our NC Live, our core base. Uh, DDA is demand-driven acquisition. That's, uh, I'll talk about that in a second and all these are more in a second. Uh, STL is called for short-term loan. ATO is access to own and PA is perpetual access, which is more like what we're, what we're used to thinking about purchasing. So that is intentional one-offs. Buy it, own it, one copy, one use, check it out. Um, so subscription, uh, that is the bulk of our stuff. That is what the bulk uh, NC Live for a lot of us. Uh, so librarians project that in 2025, around 65% of their budget will be spent on subscription packages and 15% of their budgets just on individual eBooks alone, less than 10% on actual books. So between the subscriptions and the intentional ebook purchases, we're talking about 80% content electronic is sort of what the projection of library directors is in four or five years. Okay, um, again, subscriptions are in the NC Lives, a lot of that. Uh, and many of us add to those collections. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about some of those options. EBSCO and ProQuest have some massive collections uh, that you could add. Uh, so, the positive of subscription is that it's an affordable way to, to add a critical mass of content. Uh, with one invoice, you can, urge, you, can, you can add a large swath of items and it's a good way to spend money quickly. It helps us with collection development in a couple of ways. Uh, it doesn't require much thinking or effort. Uh, and as we're given more responsibilities with fewer and fewer uh, library workers to help us uh, to carry out duties, this can be a real time saver buying a subscription. Large subscriptions offer cover a lot of variety of subject areas, things that we are not experts in and we don't know what to buy. So we can use that assistance of the vendor uh, when adding titles. Uh, the subscri subscription bundle uh, usually has a similar lending model within the bundle. So there's some consistency in what can be downloaded, how long it checks out, how many people can use it. So, for example, the ebook central database from ProQuest, most of those titles are unlimited simultaneous use uh, model. So, not all of them, but most of them. So, you can get the gist of a collection and you kind of know uh, what you're getting when you purchase it in that way. That's another benefit of the subscription is you can kind of build in that, so you can get that consistency. One of the major disadvantages is that you're just kind of hoping for usage by just generally purchasing databases or collections that you think fit subject areas that you think will get used, right? And you're, you're a good librarian, you not know your people. So you're doing your best, uh, but you don't know things will get checked out. Maybe they're, you know, maybe psychology books usually get checked out. So I'll buy a psychology collection and we'll see what happens. It's, you know, that sort of, that, that mindset with the subscription. Uh, and so we're all from, familiar with that. And that's definitely not going anywhere. That's gonna, that's definitely gonna become more and more of what you, of what you're gonna be spending your money on <laughs> it from, at least from, projections of uh, librarians. So the next layer up is a DDA, which is de demand-driven acquisition. Uh, you, could ac you can offer access to a lot of titles um, of your choosing and only pay if they get used. So DDA is kind of a way to supplement a subscription in order to build an ebook or a streaming video or e-format collection uh, with guaranteed usage 
and on-demand access that the users want. So with DDA, libraries can make large amounts of digital materials immediately discoverable and accessible. And then titles are triggered for purchase or loan if they're used at a certain level. So maybe if they, you know, 10% of the book gets used three times, you then you have to buy it. Um, your library can usually control the subjects. It can control the publishers if it wants to, the, the cost of the book. So it can, you know, cut off, say, up to 40 bucks and that's it. Everything else does not get shown to the to the person. You can control the publication date. You can control basically every param parameter with most vendors. Uh, so you're basically controlling the pool of resources that's thrown out there, but you're offering a large swath of things to your people without actually purchasing them. You're just making them available like, hey, you can use this. Um, so your library can also choose to use mediation. Mediation is an extra layer of DDA, and it's where the patron does not get the item immediately. It will see the item, it will click on the item, and then you will get triggered with an email that will say, do you uh, authorize this use? And it'll say you have two uses left or whatever before you'll be charged the full price for the book. And you just say confirm, and then the person gets emailed the item or a link to the item. So DDA has been gaining traction. This is obviously, you see in the layers here, the second most popular uh, method. Uh, about 50% of libraries right now are using DDA. Um, materials acquired through DDA are obviously gonna be used. That's the benefit of DDA, is that you know these materials are going to be used. And they're also more likely to be used again. So um, analyzing data from almost, let's see, 1,200 libraries, one study found that 41% of titles that were acquired via traditional firm order can be classified as rarely used. So 41% of things you buy traditionally um, are rarely used afterwards compared to just 14% through DDA. So the much more likely to get used again, it's kind of confusing the way it's worded, but you're much more likely to get used two times on that DDA title than you would on a traditionally purchased item. So the study basically would lead you to believe that our patrons are great at doing collection development for other patrons. They know what they would want after the initial use. There's about a 30% 30, 30 or so more better chance that it'll get used again if you use DDA. Okay. Um, so yeah, that compromise with mediation. Uh, there's another thing. Some uh, some vendors offer recommenders. So if you've used Amazon Music or Spotify, you know, but below your artist of choice, there's a recommendation for other artists. That same thing happens in a lot of more popular uh, vendor platforms, and you can have recommendations from people uh, from the users to say it's, it's very clear to them. We do not own this, but please recommend a title. It'll give them a list that you don't own. The person can click on it, you get triggered. Basically getting help with collection development from people that are already using books. And then you get their contact info. And when you buy it, if you choose to, you can contact them and say, check this out, I just bought it for you. So that's another great sort of relation you can build with uh, your, with your uh, constituencies, really, uh, that you're paying attention to what they want. So again, the big benefit, you only purchase what gets used. You quit buying so many titles without knowing they're going to be used. Uh, and you can work with vendors to make sure that you're bringing content to users that is relevant to you um, and you let the user select what they want. Um, so maybe you, you'll spend more on the titles, but you won't spend as much because you only buy what is going to actually get used. It's again, a good time to experiment. I think that that's worth experimenting with. DDA also gives you data to show your administration that your collections are being used and then they're in demand because what is everything is getting, everything I'm buying is being used. That's a powerful argument to show someone. Uh, this method also allows for less time and staff to do collection development while still making sure things are being used. So the subscriptions make sure that you don't have to use any time, but this makes sure you don't use time while providing uh, that certainty that people are getting what's most relevant to them. Okay. Um, EBSCO, ProQuest, the big vendors, they all work with libraries. They will analyze your print collections for you. 
So they will see what's being used in print uh, and they will allow you to explore all sorts of ways of doing DDA that are flexible, that make sense with what checks out in your library so that you are basically offering books that will check out later. So you can control spending by basically limiting down uh, what people see. Okay, so the next layer up is short-term loans. And this is just what it sounds like. You basically don't pay full price. You're just loaning an item. Um, so you're paying a, a percentage of a book. Uh, most libraries offer like this, this is like a just-in-time rental sort of. I'm not gonna pay the whole thing. I'm gonna pay a super, re I'm gonna pay a reduced rate just to get, you know, have this out there. Um, you can still mediate these if you want to. You can still be contacted through email before it gets checked out and the money is spent. Uh, but you definitely don't own the item. It's one, uh, one disadvantage with all of these models is that you don't own the item. Uh, another thing that's not mentioned here, but it's kind of related here, is the cost per checkout model, which is used in uh, Hoopla is a big user of this, and it's beginning to creep into overdrive as well. So the cost per checkout model is where you pay a fee for each checkout, and you set a budget limit, which can be changed, but if you keep funds in that account, all available, all the titles will always be available. So there'll be a constant availability of popular titles. So you're always going to be able to offer content your users want. So even if you need 20 copies of a book for a book club, you can always provide those, uh, that content. Of course, that can get out of control, but it is, if you have the money, or if you have um, the means of doing this, it's a great way of offering titles to your patrons whenever they want it, as many copies as is needed. Um, so Hoopla, again, is a great vendor for that. If you wanna do a book club, uh, Hoopla is great for that, as well as um, Overdrive will do that uh, as well for you. But Hoopla kind of bases their model around the cost per checkout, uh, which can be, again, it can, it can work pretty well for people. I know, I know a lot of libraries have used that. It sounds sort of, uh, sort of scary, uh, but I think once you get into and start using these things uh, and you start finding ways of controlling the, the, controlling the spending. So the next layer up is access to own. This is sort of a balance between uh, short-term loan and ownership. So this model does allow you to own. Um, this is the one model that does allow you to, to own other than the perpetual access. So uh, access to own, basically you spend a little bit of money here, a little bit of money here, and then finally you own it. So you're gonna pay more for the access. The short-term loan is gonna be cheaper access uh, per usage because you're never owning it. Access to own is gonna cost a little bit more. And by the time you actually purchase it, it's gonna cost you a lot more um, because you have bought the book or a substantial portion of the book a few different times. So this can be an expensive way of buying a book. Um, but you have control, again, over the consideration pools of books that are available, which, what, what's immediately discoverable and uh, what's accessible. And again, loans are only purchased if the eBooks are used and you can stop it before you have to pay the full, you know, the full price. Um, but the way access to own would work would be like, you know, so you have a $40 book, you pay you know, 20 bucks the first time, 40 bucks the second time, and then 80 bucks the third time. So it's it's not an affordable way of building a collection. It's a way of um, of offering some backlist title, but offering maybe frontlist titles, things that are popular that you don't know if they're going to work or not, if they're going to be attracted to your users or not. And you can sort of pay a little bit up front and then you can say, oh my goodness, that's going to be popular and then, you know, quickly purchase it. Um, not my favorite way of my favorite model, as you might, as you might tell here. The last thing at the very top is perpetual access. And this is what we would think of as traditional library purchase. You buy a copy, you own the copy forever. One copy, one use is sort of the model. Uh, you pick and choose the specific titles that your institution needs. So this is very much what we usually do. Uh, picking and choosing is nice because you know what you're getting. You are purposeful in development. However, you are again anticipating title use. While many of these other models that I'm talking about, the DDA, the STL, the ATO, uh, the CPC, the cost per checkout, all of those models, you don't have to anticipate use. Use is coming to you, they ensure use. So it's really a trade off. There's pros and cons to each method. Um, 
So you know you're not wasting money on materials that will never be used if you do the DDA route. Uh, however, you, you have to control the spending and worry about that side of things when you um, are doing that because it can cost can mount up quickly if you let it. Okay, so let me move on from that and we'll talk last slide. Let's see, not that slide. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Okay. So some purchasing options. Um, I wanted to provide you with a couple of things uh, so you know kind of where to start. Uh, I talked to both ProQuest and EBSCO. Uh, both ProQuest and EBSCO offer programs where you can have your collection analyzed. You can give them a call number range. It can be your entire collection. It can just be certain areas. They will analyze that. They will give you back um, a match with their ebook collection. So they'll basically give you a list of titles. You give them a list of your titles that you would like them to compare. They will see what they have electronically. They provide you with uh, discounts on what they can offer you electronically. Um, at one point, they were offering up to 50% off discounts. That is not the case anymore. I, am, I know that, but there are still great deals if you do that with them. Um, both EBSCO and ProQuest also de will develop lists of potential purchases for you based on your print and electronic checkouts. So you can give them those checkout lists and you don't have to do heavy lifting in terms of proactive collection development. You can set parameters around what you like. You can say, here's what checks out. Here's the parameters I want. Find the books for me. And then one collection that ProQuest offers right now that works with community colleges really well is uh, their, I think there's called their, um, sorry, I lost the college complete, it's 10,000 ebooks. That's their big chunk for community college libraries. And uh, you can obviously find out there's other, many other collections too. Their big collection uh, is the one that the ebook central at NC Live offers. They have other large collections that are not in ebook central and that college complete is the is big one that is geared towards my community. Uh, community colleges, and it's, those books are not in ebook central. And then EBSCO uh, has ebooks uh, community college, which is 68,000 ebooks. And again, those are not included in anything that we already own through NC Live. Uh, so those are two big uh, collections that could be purchased. But both of these major vendors will bend over backwards for you in analyzing your collection and trying to control spending with DDA models they have available for you and in just doing a straight replication of the titles you know check out in ebook format. Okay, I'm probably out of time here, but there's two portals, the EBSCO Collection Manager, ProQuest Lib Central. Those are the two places to go. Your vendor or your, you know, your rep can give you access to those and you can see their full catalogs in those portals. And that is my uh, presentation. Again, my name is Alan Unsworth, I'm Director of Academic Support at Surrey Community College. The full list of references that I used is in the presentation, which will be posted with these presentations. So you can get to all those on um, second to last slide here if you if you want to see all the all the studies and things that I, I mentioned. Thank you, Alan. Um, we also have a, a question in the chat. If you would share the link for your guide. Um, that was posted earlier in the presentation. So I okay. think she's asking for maybe uh, one of the lib guides. I will try to. I know I, I simplified that a lot because it became so unwieldy and we weren't even bothering to maintain it anymore. But I think similar. I did a presentation with NC Live uh, with one of their employees that's no longer there. <laughs> and we had this huge presentation. I developed this little guy for that presentation and I'll see if I can find it somewhere. Uh, if not, um, is there any, is there, sorry, I don't have the chat up. Do they have an email there? I know, but it's Catherine Lee. Gotcha. Catherine is who asked for it. Catherine, I'll try to find, uh, something like that. I know what I have now is a pared down version of it. So I had to quit maintain, I just didn't have to maintain it anymore. I was just straight sending people to the, you know, uh, to the website. So if you want to download a book from EBSCO, there's a link because I got so tired of doing the instructions of maintaining the instructions. Um, but I think there's probably things out there. I'll see what I can find for you. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Alan. Yeah, yeah you're, you're welcome. I wish I had made a copy of that thing and not deleted it, but I'll see what I can find. Uh, do we have anyone with any other questions for Alan? 
you can unmute and ask, or uh, you can uh, pop them in the chat. All right, in that case, um, I want to say thank you again for joining us today for uh, for this conference. We appreciate your participation. We appreciate all of the presenters and um, we will end here for now. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Yes. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.